I'm very excited to be here, even in this virtual world. Uh, it presents interesting challenges, of course. Um, so what we'll be talking about a little bit is about our paper on the uh, three perspectives of uh, in dealing primarily with uh, buyers, uh, suppliers, and integrators. So first, kind of an, an overview, you know, when today we all understand, you know, we're in an industry of the evolution and uh, the solution space is becoming very complex. Right, you have the disparate services and technologies and methodologies, uh, which are often achieved really through a unification of legacy systems and new technologies. So this, the whole focus of this is really maintaining operational and uh, uh, competitive uh, benefits in this changing world. So we need to actually, you know, rapidly develop and rapidly adapt our uh, systems as well as uh, uh, create and bring new ones online. So our paper here discusses really the concerns, risks, and challenges, and really the benefits of utilizing the face reference architecture in order to meet those challenges and utilizing it, uh, in particular, the face data architecture um, in, in utilizing it to benefit the whole process. Now here we look, and as part of the three roles of interactions, we present a very simple case of the uh, buyers, suppliers, integrators. And, and you might note on supplier three, you know, some of these are off the shelf uh, components. So really the idea is how to pull all this together from uh, your specification, how to integrate those, and of course, what the suppliers need to do. Now, as Captain Wilson mentioned a little earlier, um, one of the things with uh, MOSA, as we look at our modular open systems approach, it really begs a question or begs a solution of model-based systems engineering. And that's really where FACE enters the fray. It really does help uh, manage some of that complexity. And, and when we look at this model-based most, it really helps us through uh, unification of those legacy systems, right, as well as those new systems. So that's a real focus. Now, one thing I'll, I'll mention is I'm going to talk about uh, the buyer perspective. And then Bill Tanner will talk about the supplier perspective. And then Leanne will follow up with the integrator perspective. Okay, so the buyer perspective. So the real focus here when we look at the uh, MOSA approach, right, is really it's a divide and conquer approach. And this diagram, by the way, it's not marked, but is a benefit uh, uh, provided by uh, uh, Southwest Research Institute out of San Antonio. Um, so it's a divide and conquer and really looks at the flow and the life cycle of your system and breaks that up into the different pieces. So from a buyer's perspective, the idea and the real focus is really developing the specification so they can go out for procurement for the integrators and for your uh, uh, suppliers as well, potentially. Some of those components uh, that are purchased like off the shelf are then provided to the integrator as a, as part of complete uh, subsystems. So it really adds to a lot of complexity. Now there's a question is how do they do that, right? How do you create these specifications? Now there, there's a lot of work through different technologies. <clears throat> of course, you know, uh, when we talk MBSC, everybody hears SysML and, and that's one key uh, technology, but it's not the only one. There's other ones out there such as AADL, FACE, um, and, and the real focus is how to integrate all these uh, different model-based systems engineering tools to really create this uh, solid specification that's not ambiguous. Uh, and when we have ambiguity, it's really the enemy uh, of any systems development effort. If it's ambiguous, it means uh, it takes someone's interpretation or the, they have to seek clarification. So it becomes a real problem uh, for long-term uh, systems development. And usually when people uh, make assumptions about the specifications, which is horrible, uh, we end up with uh, uh, the problems arising or, or identified much later in the, the cycle. And that gets very expensive when you look at your life cycle. So the phase data architecture, um, one of the things we do talk a little bit in the paper, but uh, there is a limited amount of space in the paper and in presentations, obviously, we only get 20 minutes. 
some of these topics could take uh, days to discuss. Um, but it's really, how do you take the face data architecture and how does it support that specification? Now, some of the key areas we look at, because face was designed for unambiguous identification of your uh, data, right, is really defining your data dictionary within your system and being able to share that with your suppliers and integrators. So one of the key components is really understanding what we're talking about. And it doesn't just do that in terms of the semantic definition or what the thing is, but it also does it in terms of the measurement specifics. We are dealing with aerospace after all, and so the key is making sure that the, we all understand exactly what it is. But it, but it goes beyond just the uh, data itself. It also gets into your performance, uh, understanding the different units of portability as they are defined in the system. There's a functional, non-functional specification, as well as uh, one of the keys is also interface specification, making sure we really understand what those interfaces are and we specify them sufficiently, but not over-specified to reduce the uh, flexibility needed in any uh, development or, or uh, integration effort. So next, uh, Bill Tanner will talk a little bit about the uh, supplier perspective. Hi, thanks, Sean. Okay, so, um, so from a supplier perspective, um, you know, really what I focused on was my experiences with building uh, data models for um, the aviation system integration facility uh, work um, in, in basically in phase 2.1. And so what I've tried to present is some practical or pragmatic uh, approaches and how I manage things. Um, I bought in, you know, real early to the fact that I could be able to create a conceptual model from which I could generate uh, multiple logical and platform instances. And so that kind of worked well for uh, the varying projects that we had. So if you look at this common V diagram, uh, there are really three different efforts that, or types of efforts that I would uh, encounter. One where it was pretty much like a greenfield from from the very beginning and I could define the concepts and the semantics and and, and pretty much have control over that. Um, others were a little bit of mix um, where there were some requirements coming up, coming in from project management or engineers or uh, maybe even system people that didn't really have that much uh, experience, but they had um, some SME knowledge in the subject matter. So that was a very good thing. Other times I was basically given a set of header files and said, hey, go, you know, go make a face data model for this that's conformant and uh, we don't really have any time to to, to tell you, um, you know, what these things mean. And so what I found out is one of the, one of the real benefits that I thought of FACE was that I could model each of those um, successfully and actually get um, a FACE file that was conformant and that, and that did the need. Um, go ahead and uh, uh, advance the slide if you would, Sean. So that, that kind of brings up some issues here, right? Um, you can actually have a FACE file um, that passes conformance but doesn't really truly reflect uh, accurately the semantics or the context um, that was intended. Um, and so that's flexible and that allows you to, um, you know, if you've got only a few hours budgeted to, to you know, to get something um, accomplished that's conformant, um, but it kind of defeats a, a little bit of the purpose. Um, so there's, there's a concern there, uh, but I definitely thought that was a benefit. Um, you know, that we could, we could move on and we could make um, changes in the future. Um, that's another really uh, interesting point is point three is this realization disconnect. And what the realization disconnect allows you to do is really disconnect the, the messages and the views from the semantic context um, and, and the definition of the meaning of, of the data that's in the messages or in the views. And so that's very powerful, powerful because if you have make it, making a miss, if you make a mistake um, in the semantics or in your understanding of the semantics progresses over time, then it's very helpful because you can change the upper portion of the model. That's to say the conceptual and the logical, uh, perhaps, um, without uh, influencing what the platform views or the platform messages look like. Um, so there was some flexibility. Um, some some folks don't um, really, um, you know, when they're building these models, they're not too keen on um, having to harden the frame of references and or the units. 
Um, but that's just a little, um, you know, thing that we kind of deal, deal with. And some of that's been mitigated a little bit in 3.0, although I don't talk about it too much. Um, and then the code generation is, is tied pretty much to the platform. And so there's some issues there where you want to, um, where you want to have your naming conventions um, lined up, especially for the platform types. Um, go ahead and uh, advance to the next slide. Here's just, uh, you know, again, trying to be a little pragmatic and show you what I did. Um, this is just kind of one uh, conceptual, logical, and platform and UOP model um, uh, packaging that might be of use to some people. And, um, you know, I know we're kind of constrained on time, so I'm not going to go through this too much. But really, um, the, the, the goal was to try to keep the common, uh, generic, uh, more abstract, uh, conceptual semantics and context within the conceptual model, um, you know, independent of any particular um, uh, specific project. Now, I broke that a few times when, um, you know, I didn't have the time to do those abstractions, but that would certainly be an opportunity to go back and rework those. Uh, but this generally worked for me. And so this is an example that you can think of. And kind of with that, the, the following slide goes into uh, a couple, or the following two slides go into a couple different ways of, of managing um, how the, the changes occur from conceptual to logical. Um, there's this notion of a single entity with multiple characteristics where um, you've got something like a rotorcraft and you need to realize the, the speeds differently um, using different frames of reference, different units, and perhaps even different constraints. So that's one way to do it. Um, and you can see that I've used uh, um, some suffixes to the names of the um, to the characteristic compositions there, um, P1, P2, you know, perhaps for um, project one, project two. Um, and then you can see similarly at the platform level um, with a type one and type two. And um, that gives you kind of a flexibility uh, without having to create a lot of redundancy. Now, the next slide shows um, realization of into separate entities. And, um, and that was just another way of doing things. Um, sometimes I did a combination of each. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, come clean. Is I, what I tried to do with this model, it had kind of a twofold purpose. It had um, the purpose of showing what, um, it, you know, or providing what needed to be done and then also exploiting as many as the phase two one constructs as, as I could. So, um, so I think that's it. And uh, we're ready for Leanne now. Hi. So uh, can everybody hear me? Um, yeah, so um, when we're looking at the integration perspective, uh, the we looked at um, the traditional challenges for uh, an integrator. Uh, some of those were legacy systems and custom solutions, and the challenges that they they provide uh, generally being brittle, uh, patched over their life cycle. So they're and uh, you know the custom custom solutions are usually narrow in purpose. So they're not well suited to integration into a larger uh, systems of systems. Um, and when you consider additionally the multi-organizational solutions, you have challenges there for the integrator in understanding the domain of the interfaces defined, uh, possibly the number of interfaces they need to support, and other data rights. Um, and the number three was the uh, data interpretation. It was found that um, even within teams, there was not necessarily a common understanding of the data. So when you start to build that out uh, in a larger organization and a group, the, the breadth of that knowledge and the understanding of the data becomes skewed. Um, the last, last point for the challenges was the skill set. As these systems and systems become broader, the integrator has to be has to uh, have a blending of skills, and that that gets difficult for um, building those in the marketplace. Next slide. So, um, looking at the traditional uh, the traditional integration, this kind of shows you graphically the challenges that were um, encountered with a multi vendor solution. Um, so, uh, you know, as I spoke, you, you have um, you have interfaces that are defined um, custom, or they're uh, 
uh, proprietary. So, you, you know, going, going left, to right vendor a has has a certain set of interfaces. They're not standardized. Um, so it gets difficult to integrate those with the other vendors, vendor B and vendor C, because the points may or may not align. Um, in, in some cases, some of those uh, solutions are still monolithic and, and that again presents a challenge because your, your alignment is, is not there and then it causes a, a more work for the integrator, either uh, writing adapters or, or uh, working uh, to integrate those through uh, additional means. Um, and then uh, when you look down toward the bottom, this graphic shows you that there is, is a bit of a horizontal achievement for each of those vendors across that last component. But the point is here that um, without, uh, in a traditional environment, they, those are typically opportunistic and not, not well coordinated. Uh, next slide. Uh, so now here's a look at, at integrating those same types of vendor uh, solutions in a an EMBOSA environment with an MBSC approach and um, what the FACE standard gives us there. So when you look at the FACE standard, it defines the interfaces for us. It has the, the OS interfaces, it has the transport services interfaces, um, it's, it's uh, the IO interfaces. So with, with a well-defined interface and it has convergence among the, the industry, that allows us to have a, a, a anticipate better where those integration points will be and it allows us to coordinate better. So we can, we can be in a position where we can achieve the horizontal modularity and it gives us more opportunities to do so. Additionally, with the transport services interface and a data model, we can now capture that data uh, and express that semantic meaning in a very powerful way so that there is, is less ambiguity and, and everybody understands the interpretation of that data. So again, the face with the most are, gives us um, much more powerful tools for horizontal modularity as well as vertical modularity uh, within a systems of system solution. Uh, next slide. So uh, to conclude the effort here with the three perspectives looking at that, you know, we're, we're very much saying that uh, the FACE standard and MOSA is, is a powerful tool set to, uh, you know, achieving, achieving integration, achieving the, the needs of the buyers and the suppliers. Uh, all in a all in a solution set that and in a process that uh, gives us a good path forward. Um, we recommend that all of those roles are um, participate in base data architecture, the development, understanding of the data, and um, it gives us the best of breeds from our component standpoint for moving forward in the industry. Thanks. Okay, that concludes our presentation. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. We have one question come in. We have a couple minutes till we're at our breaking point. So let me um, read that to you. Have you considered the open group standard open data element framework for a common semantic starting point? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Uh, we, when we originally looked at the face data architecture, um, we did a uh, pretty exhaustive analysis of all the things that were out there. Now, this has been quite a few years. Um, and uh, what we identified was things like SysML and UML and, and every other ML. They really didn't provide enough uh, semantic definition in terms of the measurement or the frame of reference as well as uh, the semantic uh, relationships, right? The interrelationships of the data. So the real challenge, you know, we had was we needed to develop the, this uh, data architecture. Now, what we did in face is we didn't tie it to a single uh, definition of different elements, but allowed them as, you know, building blocks. We do have a shared data model, which uh, does 
provide the foundational kind of observables that we call observables or fundamental things like mass, weight, and that. And then we added, uh, uh, of course, measurements that define things like measurement systems. It's similar to uh, topologies or metric spaces to be able to build that model. So what we find is most of the existing model uh, uh, data architectures that are out there, um, like UDEF or, or uh, Open Data Element Framework, they can be built on top of FACE, um, but it's a little hard to adapt and take it wholesale. 